So we have one back back on the show, but it's going to be something a bit different from our usual interview format. We're going to be talking about E2 Hawkeye facts. So I think you've got a list for us, Wombat. Can you share a few with us, Fuzz? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me back. I, I love being on. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day. You know, the E2 is a plane that a lot of people don't really know much about. I don't know if I can credit myself to being the one that brought it into <laughs> the lime life, but I'll take credit until somebody else tries to take it. Um, but yeah, some interesting things um, in no particular order. Um, it is one of the, if not the longest flying uh, U.S. Navy aircraft currently in production um, because the prototype, which was the, let me get it right, the YW-2F1 took its first flight on October 21st, 1960. Cool. So quite a while ago. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because I thought it was a bit later than that. And from the prototype, was it um, essentially a brand new aircraft or was it like a Frankenstein of other aircraft put together? So, so my understanding is... Uh, the idea was from previous aircraft, but it was a complete buildup um, from the start, you know, as, as this as this platform to be more um, more dedicated. You know, originally when it came out, I mean, it's I don't want to say its sole purpose, but its large purpose was to be able to detect Russian bear bombers coming after the carrier strike group. Mm -hmm. um, now it's obviously morphed into a whole lot more than that. Um, that being said, in my career, I did actually track and intercept a Russian bear with the E2. So I guess it could still go back to its roots and, you know, they weren't doing anything, you know, harmful. They just, they like to come over and fly over the ship just to show that they can. And, you know, we were able to, the guys in the back and, and, uh, my co-pilot and I were able to, uh, to find them and track them and get the fighters on them so they could have a good photo op. And so, you know, even with all the things it's evolved to, it it still can do its original job pretty darn well. Great stuff. Fact number two. So speaking of what it came off of, um, the previous aircraft was the E-1 Tracer, which is interesting looking. Um, <laughs> unlike the round dome that the E-2 has, it the E-1 is more of the like a teardrop shape um, type of aircraft. And it replaced that so that the E-2... Hawkeye and its earliest variants have been flying since 1964 in the fleet. So it took four years from the prototype to being fleet ready and replacing the E-1. Yeah, I looked at a picture of the Tracer because, I, again, I've never heard of that aircraft. It's not the prettiest. And, you know, uh, the dome actually looks like, you know, one of them bicycle helmets where it's aerodynamic. It looks almost exactly. like one of those. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, yeah, in, in, certainly an interesting aircraft. And uh, it's, it's, it's got nothing on the E2 on looks. But, uh, yeah, next, <laughs> fact, uh, one back. Which, be which is really saying something, sadly, because <laughs> I don't know if the E2 has much on looks either. But, um, well, you talk about the, the dome. So it's 24 foot in diameter. So it's big to give people perspective there. Um, but the thing that a lot of people don't realize is it provides zero lift and zero drag whatsoever. Yes. Uh, that's so people would me. think that it's yeah. there, you know, to be able to handle um, or, or be able to provide something or at least have a negative. And it does, it does none of them. So it's just neutral, just there. So how is it neutral? Like, surely that, like, that dome is a parasite for the aircraft or is it just can't build up the speed? It just doesn't affect it at all. It doesn't affect it at all. So in fact, um, and I don't think this is one of my other ones, but it's not. So I'll throw this little tidbit in there. Our NATOPS uh, that we have, and obviously every country has their own variant, but essentially the NATOPS is for people that don't know is the, the Bible, the book that we learn okay. the aircraft systems on. There was a whole section in our NATOPS on how to fly the aircraft uh, without the dome if it needed to be transported without the dome, which I always wanted to do. That was one of my few few goals in life uh, that I did not accomplish as I think it would be cool. Um, but the section was incredibly small. It was like, if I remember right, like two pages, you know, and it was, wow. it, it was, it was very minimal. So it, it really had, had no effect. And, and when I got, I showed up to training, I thought for sure that it was going to, you know, like, oh, this thing, it's going to make the plane slow. It's going to, you know, I mean, it's huge. You know, when you see it in person, if you see it in an air show, the, the dome is ridiculous size. Mm. Um, I don't think 24 foot in diameter gives it the perspective, but that's a big dish spinning on the top of a, a plane uh, that size. And it was crazy to learn that it, it really does 
does nothing. Yeah, so when you're going through training and just flying the jet, uh, the aircraft in general, you couldn't feel that weight on the top at all. No, it's so uh, the plane is so overpowered. Um, now I have heard, and I never flew the E2D. Um, I've heard the E2D has a little, little bit more of an issue weight wise because they've put uh, so much more avionics in the back and heavier avionics, and they've really jammed that. I mean, the, the capabilities of the E2D is from even the little bit that I know of that I'm allowed to know of as just a, <laughs> just a civilian. Now it's very impressive. It's quite an upgrade and I'm very happy to know that it is in our arsenal. Um, but the E2C, uh, Hawkeye 2000, any of the variants, four blade, eight blade, anything I flew. No, it, it's, I mean, it down low, it is, it's a beast. It really is. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, go on to your next fat, uh, one, but um let me see let me see how about this is an odd thing speaking about the airframe so it has four tails which people know <clears throat> if you remember the the s3 viking that the navy had big tall tail right uh, obviously not um propeller engines and then it had wings that would fold uh much like every aircraft on the aircraft carrier and the tail on an s3 viking would actually it would it would break in half and fold down if it needed to go in the hangar underneath uh, underneath the flight deck. So they originally designed the E2 to be that way because that was what they knew. You know, okay, one. I mean, if you think about it, the design of the tail of a Hawkeye is so different than almost any other plane you've seen in history. They really had to go back to the drawing board on it, and the main reason why they had to was because when they had designed it initially, and this kind of goes to another. Um, Another point, so we'll combine these facts a little bit, but it has, uh, unlike a lot of multi-engine propeller planes, it is not counter-rotating propellers. So they mm -hmm. both rotate the same direction, which gives it a ton of P factor from that, a ton of yaw. So they need a big rudder surface to counteract that. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is, is when they designed it with a single rudder and then they designed it to kind of fold in half like the S3, it was still too big to fit in the hangar bay. <laughs> so they couldn't get it down there. So, uh, so Grumman came back and said, okay, well, based on the P factor and uh, the left motor being the critical engine and the way the plane yaws, you really need two rudders on the left side and one on the right. So that was their, their, they brought that back. They actually brought it back to the Navy with three rudders, but they weren't equally spaced. There was two on the left side of the aircraft and one on the far right. And the Navy looked at that and they were like, that looks ridiculous. Like <laughs> we've never seen anything like that. And, you know, of course the engineers thinking like engineers are like, but that's, that's all you need. That's how it works. It works fine. And the Navy's like, yeah, but that's ridiculous. So uh, they had them put on another tail to balance it out, but it's completely, it has no aerodynamic qualities. It does nothing. It's just there for looks. There we go. And if you move on to your next one, Wombat. <clears throat> so again, that's the counter rotating, uh, bring that prop or that idea up. A lot of people ask why, right? Because obviously a plane with counter rotating propellers is a lot easier to fly, right? Cause that P factor is, is canceling out. It's, there's not nearly as much yaw needed. Uh, God forbid you lose an engine. It's a lot easier to control. Um, if you lost the left motor in the Hawkeye, it was, the rudder went to the floor, you trimmed it all the way at the stop, and then you still had to hold rudder for the rest of the flight. I mean, you couldn't trim out to equal. And yeah, I've only lost two motors in the Hawkeye. I'll let you guess which one it was. Um, <laughs> but I swear they never put bad motors on the right side for some reason. But the reason, because a lot of people are like, well, you know, it's it's the Navy. It's grum Why wouldn't you just build counter-rotating props? Well, if you think about life on an aircraft carrier, space is always a commodity. So if you have counter rotating propellers, those are different engines, different gearboxes. Now you need a spare of each one. Mm -hmm. So the Navy didn't want it to be counter rotating because they're like, well, we just want one spare gearbox, one spare engine, one spare set of props, and that's it because that's all we have room for. So unfortunately, the pilots suffered, but that was the reason for the non counter rotating props. Well, on that, you did mention another fact, maybe you can go into it, is sure. the, uh, the wingspan and the space on the deck, that would fit nicely into this. Sure. So that actually was where I was going with this is um, it is 
80 foot, just over 80 foot, 80 foot, seven inches technically, but we would call it an 80 foot wingspan. And on the aircraft carrier, the flight deck is 85 foot uh, wide. So you Crazy. have two and a half foot either side of center line and you'd be hitting things. And, you know, a lot of people, when I say that, they're like, yeah, but they don't park planes right on that. That's ridiculous. Well, they do. Um, I mean, those foul lines that you can see on the on the aircraft carrier, they pull planes right up to them because again, every inch counts, right? It seems like such a huge boat, but when you have so many aircraft and so many moving parts, they fill it. So planes would be right there and, and a tribute to this uh, or a story I could tell to this is um, one of my best friends, probably my best friend uh, who was my inspiration for Clipper in, in the book series. Um, the reason his call sign was Clipper is because he was coming down off San Diego, uh, one night, beautiful night. The ship was kind of, they would, they would hunt for the winds sometimes to try to get the perfect amount of wind down the angle of the, the deck. And, uh, they turned on him inside a mile, which they're not really supposed to do. Uh, at that point, you kind of just take what you got and, you know, cause again, two and a half feet is all we have. Uh, and he fought lineup, which ended up, you know, kind of messing up his his scan. And uh, he boltered. But when he boltered, he was enough off center line that his right wingtip went through the tail of three super hornets that were parked on the bow. Oh, when he went back really? airborne, uh, took two foot of the right wingtip off. Um, he got back airborne. The the long story is they brought him back around to land again instead of sending him to San Diego, which probably wasn't the smartest decision uh, in hindsight because the shit, the plane had to be craned off the ship when we pulled back into port, which ended up damaging it. But, um, the, the Grumman tech reps came out and they said that if it was like another, it was less than two inches, they would have severed all the hydraulic lines and all that. So, um, and that's just a tribute to how little operating space you have. And, and, you know, a lot of people that aren't aware I think people that have flown it or people that have been LSOs that have waived it, they understand. Um, but a lot of people that are, that are a little bit, um, I don't want to say ignorant, just, just not educated on the aircraft think, Oh, well, it's a, got a fly, a slower approach speed, right? So it's easier to handle and it has all this power. Well, when you figure in all that P factor, it, it's approach speed is the same as a super Hornet to the ship within a couple knots. So mm. it's still coming aboard pretty fast and you know you have a very small window to put it in and uh and it's you can tell even to this day when i fly with civilian pilots the ones that flew the e2 or the c2 because the c2 is the same wingspan um they always land on center line always <laughs> like that is just their their thing and i mean it had to it was beat into us on day one of uh the frs training is you you had to be on center line period so and there's actually a on that note, there's a special barricade, not that we use the barricade very often in the Navy, but there is a special barricade for the E2 that has two holes in the, in the net. Yeah. And, um, and you, it, you have to be on center line to get your props through those holes or it'll chew up the barricade. So it's a uh, center line is, is a Hawkeye pilot's best friend. <laughs> it's the only <laughs> place they fly. So really stuff. So yeah, just uh, have you got any more to wrap up? Uh, this, uh, I got two more. So um, speaking more to the crew, because a lot of people ask me that, um, you know, how many people are in it, things like that. And there's five air crew, uh, two pilots and, and three NFOs in the back. Um, the NFOs, the interesting thing about them is the, so the pilots have ditching hatches above our heads um, and they're closed for takeoff and landing. Um, and we each have our own. And, and the idea is there's a big handle above there that you could open it at the last mm -hmm. second if you needed to. The NFOs, uh, they have one ditching hatch for the three of them. It's all the way above the, the back, the furthest back NFO. And they actually take it out for takeoff and landing. Mm -hmm. So it's already out and stowed because the idea is if we had to ditch, likely the fuselage would bend and they wouldn't be able to get it out. Um, so that was part of our, our pre takeoff and pre landing checks was to make sure that that was out and stowed. Um, but with regards to them in the back, um, they actually, their seats swivel. So they sit facing forward for the takeoff and landing, but for the rest of the flight, they actually turn 90 degrees to the left and are facing the control panels. 
um, which is which is kind of interesting based on the the angle of attack that we would fly. You know, it, <laughs> whenever I would go back there to kind of sit, it it would be very vertigo inducing to to sit and to swivel like that. Um, but that was basically the the standard operating procedure. So one of the pictures that I've posted that I think a lot of people like is there was a, a Super Hornet that joined up on us and uh, my my ACO, which is the the air control officer all the way in the back, had the ditching hatch out because we were getting ready to land. And he gave the Super Hornet a thumbs up out of the ditching hatch. And <laughs> if you zoom in on the picture, you could see it. And they, they thought it was pretty funny on the ship, you know, because people don't realize that, that that's out there. So um so that's that's kind of my my last fact about the back seaters uh my final fact unless you have other questions is regarding the pilots because i get this so there's two pilots um unlike you know uh civilian like airliners there's not a captain and a first officer it's just two equal pilots um somebody was the aircraft commander uh for that particular flight it didn't have to be the person in the left or right seat it, we swapped um but the the um <clears throat> excuse me the the person in the left seat was typically the pilot that would do the takeoff and landing now both pilots could at any point um and i would occasionally practice a landing from the right seat at the field but the main reason why the left seat pilot's the one that was doing the takeoff and landing has to go to the the uh the lens on the ship and where it's located um you know the eye flaws and all that is on the left side of the ship so it's easier to see uh so that's why typically the left seat pilot does that we would um in the navy we had to have one of our biggest battles was night currency you had to have a night landing every seven days uh while you were deployed and that was easy to do when i flew hornets but flying e2s we would fly longer missions typically so yeah. one of the things we would do is we would come down first the left seat pilot who had flown there the whole flight would trap. They would taxi us to the catapult and shoot us off while the rest of the Hornets would come down. And we would go uh, on downwind and switch seats <laughs> at really? 2,500 feet. Yep. Very rudimentary autopilot if it even oh. worked. And we would swap seats. And by the time you got strapped in, you were pretty much at a mile behind the ship, ready to do your landing. And uh, that was probably one of the tougher <laughs> things I did in the Hawkeye just because uh, to, to switch that mindset from, from kind of being a, a co-pilot to a pilot is, is, is pretty tough, especially in that landing environment. From my understanding, which is rudimentary, because again, you know, I walked in the door and went left up front, but yeah. uh, the positions in the back is we would have a SECO, which is kind of the overall mission commander that sat in the middle seat back there. Um, when, they, when they turned to the left and they were looking at their scopes, to that person's left was the ACO, which is the air combat uh, officer. That was the the one that was probably doing most of the controlling of air to air assets. But to the right was the RO, the radar officer, um, and they were usually the most junior on the crew. Usually, okay. and their job was one hundred percent to get that radar system online and then to keep it cool because that's a huge issue is keeping mm. that thing cool for the flight. If it overheated, it would shut down. Um, but one of the things that was interesting fun little tidbit is they had the option to um, rotate the dome at either five or six, which I found that number very funny, five or six rotations per minute. I have no idea why that stuck in my head for all these years. Right. Um, but just because the radar dome was spinning did not mean that the radar was emitting. Oh, so, okay. oh, yeah. so it took a while. I mean, you had one sole crew member's job on man up was to get that radar system coming up and online and all that. There's obviously with the amount of emissions that it emits, we would not emit on the ground. Um, there were stories that if all of the fail safes failed and that thing emitted, it would actually light people on fire. That's how much radar energy comes out of that. Really? thing. So it would never turn on on the ground. Um, mm. That didn't make me feel really good sitting underneath it for <laughs> six hours at a time. But um, there were protections built into the plane for that. But but just because the dome was spinning doesn't mean uh, that it was emitting. So one of the funnier jokes that I know that the NFOs would play on some of the Hornet pilots, fighter pilots, is if they would join up on us, they would have the dome spinning. And then when we'd land, be like, hey, we didn't know you were there. That was emitting. You need to go see the flight doc. Like they have to do all these <laughs> tests on you now. And it was one of the ways to kind of mess with the new new fighter pilots that I know the, the <laughs> NFOs really enjoyed. So um, and it was, you know, it was funny and, until you realize you're sitting underneath it. You would hear it over the ICS 
uh, which is again, a little discerning, uh, <laughs> but you would hear as the, as the beam would sweep over the cockpit, you would hear a noise over the ICS very wow, faint. Really? And, and uh, yeah, so it was very powerful. Um, with regards to that, but essentially there was, I mean, obviously everybody in the back could kind of do everybody else's job to some degree, but there was a mm -hmm. dedicated position of just focusing on that radar. Cause without it, you really are losing a lot of your mission capability. Absolutely. Well, some great facts there about the E2 and I've learned a lot there. So cheers <laughs> for that one, Bat. but uh, yeah, let's talk about your websites obviously had a refresh and I have to say it looks really great. So yeah. Can you just tell us about this and what's new on it? Sure. So, uh, it, kind of was at the end of last year, it, it got to a point where, you know, both books were doing well. Um, I think it was after the second book kind of hit the bestseller list on Amazon that it was time for me to, you know, nice. pretend like I was actually pseudo a professional in this. <laughs> and uh, it was time to basically uh, take the website from like a blog design to actually something professional. Um, mm -hmm. But I didn't know how to do that. So um, uh, a woman by the name of, of Sarah, who I have tagged many times on my Instagram, if you're interested in her work, uh, I am, am employed her to do it. Uh, her attention to detail, I mean, it, it shows in everything. And I think it's created more of a user interface to where whatever you want, whether it's to get to know about me, get to know about my career, learn about the books, get merchandise directly, it's all right there, um, which... You know, even the the merchandise in the past was was such a hassle for everybody because if you wanted to buy a coin or or a signed book or something like that, it was well, you emailed me and we played this game back and forth. And now you just go on there, you order it, pops up. If it's something that I carry here, I mail it out. If it's something like the shirts or things, stickers like that, it goes out directly. And um, the feedback's been been really good. Uh, additionally, there's you know she kind of cleaned up. Uh, it's under, I believe, my logbook under there, the tab, you know, some of the other writing articles I've done, tributes to people, uh, friends that I've lost or, or other things about aviation. So it's, I think it's a much cleaner user face, user interface, and uh, it gives me a platform to really kind of share the books, but also share that, you know, as you know, because you follow way too much the the never down never out mentality and trying to keep people going towards their goals and, and things like that which is very important as well yeah absolutely and um, for people who want to get in contact with you what's the best way do you prefer instagram facebook email or what's best for you one but so it it really depends i i try my best and and as somebody that's out there you know it's it's tough um i try to have every platform out there instagram facebook twitter everything um, but I would say just because of how some of those platforms work, if it's, you know, if it's a comment or something, absolutely. Instagram, Twitter, that's fine. But if it's something that you're really trying to get a hold of me for, you know, whether it's a question or, um, you know, even not that, you know, maybe this will happen, but, you know, speaking engagements or anything like that, email's the best thing. And that's, there's a whole tab on that on the website. Um, cause I will get that. I've noticed <clears throat> sometimes, you know, depending on the profile of the individual on Instagram, it kind of gets lost, you know, and you mm. won't see it. And, mm. you know, then I'll get an email and somebody's like, I've been messaging you. And I'm like, it, it didn't come through. So I think there, that's, that's some of those social media platforms ways of trying to protect us a little bit, but it kind of works against us. So email always works and that's on the website. Um, there's a contact in there and it, it goes direct to it. So that I always get for sure stuff and it'll be all linked in the description below guys but one bat thanks very much for coming on the show again it's always a pleasure as usual absolutely i love it anytime you want me i'm here it's always fun great one well i'll speak to you soon all right sounds good have a great day